Clocks have been factory installed in cars for almost as long as cars have existed. It's helpful to have an idea of the time while driving to your destination. But why do some 70s and 80s cars have the word quartz on their clocks? Is this a brand of clock? Is it just a marketing term? And why did they go away? Let's find out. Let's start towards the beginning with mechanical clocks. In the early 1900s, clocks required an outside force to stay in working order. This was done by occasionally winding them with a key or with the rim of the watch. This would set a predictable amount of tension inside of the clock, allowing it to keep time accurately. This is standard operation for all clocks and watches of the era. Most smaller clocks needed to be wound every two days, but to stay on top of things, it's best to do it regularly, or in this case, every time you drive your car. To further the issue with traditional clocks, their internal mechanisms are subject to extreme temperature change. As they heat up or freeze, they'll start to tell time differently as the materials inside expand and contract. This isn't really an issue for wall clocks or wrist watches since your home and body temperature is normally pretty consistent, but a car is a different story. It sits out in the elements where heat, cold, and inconvenient weather get at them all day every day, and thus the clocks inside of them would be thrown off time as the weather changed. It was time to make some changes. Enter quartz. Yeah, kind of like the Minecraft ore. Quartz is a compound called silicon dioxide. The important thing to know is that when quartz is exposed to an electrical current, it reacts in a very predictable way. This makes quartz clocks very accurate. They also do not require any form of winding or twisting to keep their time. They feed off the electrical current of the car's battery, or watch battery, making winding keys completely obsolete. Furthermore, quartz clocks do not shift as much when the temperature changes. Quartz does not expand and contract in temperature change like the older mechanisms. That's not to say that they are completely indifferent to temperature change, but at least less so than the more traditional clocks. The final advantage of quartz clocks is that they can be synced together off the same electrical current, and more recently, they can be synced over Wi-Fi or radio signals making their time drift down to less than one second a year, where previous mechanical watches could drift over two minutes per year. So when did this technology get into the public's hands? It was invented in the early 1920s. They nearly perfected quartz ability to keep time in 1923 at Bell Telephone Laboratories, which later became Nokia. Here's what's left of my local Bell Labs facility. It's nearly a ghost town. But maybe that's for another video. The issue with the first quartz clocks was their size. They were good at keeping time, but they were much too large for the public to buy. It wasn't until the 1960s when Seiko brought the first quartz pocket watch to market, of which it was used as a backup timer for the 1964 Summer Olympics in Tokyo, Japan. This kicked off the quartz dominance in public timekeeping, but it also led to the quartz crisis. Before the 1970s, Swiss watchmakers were the creme de la creme, the tippy top. Swiss companies prided themselves on intricate mechanisms that kept time. They did not contain any quartz. Watchmaking in Switzerland was a large part of their culture and national pride, and thus they did not want to change to the new quartz digital era. Globally, however, consumers started to like the more accurate and new technology of quartz. In 1978, quartz clocks overtook sales of mechanical clocks, plunging the Swiss watchmaking industry into a tailspin. Two-thirds of Swiss watchmakers went out of business, and over 60,000 hard-working Swiss men and women lost their jobs, all because the leaders of their companies failed to get with the times. This opened up the market to more Japanese and American watchmakers who had adapted the quartz years before. One of these American companies was Texas Instruments, who make the famed TI-84 calculators that every high school student uses. The mechanical watch didn't fully die, however, and has actually become something of luxury due to all of the moving pieces. Rolex is known for this. So how does this relate to cars? This is a car channel after all. 
Well, as we just discussed, quartz clocks gained dominance to consumers in the late 1970s. This was then reflected in the cars. If you bought a new car in this era, it was nice to see that your onboard clock was one of the newest technology. It was a marketing ploy to put quartz wherever the clock was. The actual use of quartz clocks was also beneficial for cars with temperature change and no winding required. So that's it. That's why you see quartz clocks in 70s and 80s cars. It was the new, best timekeeping tech at the time, and car makers wanted to make it known to their buyers. But where did they go? Why did quartz clocks go away? Well, they really didn't. Quartz is still a great way to keep time in a car, but it later became unfashionable to label them as quartz. It's the same as cars advertising disc brakes. In the 1970s, that was a big deal, but now pretty much all passenger cars have disc brakes. It's no longer marketed as such a big deal. However, now with the entrance of screens in cars, quartz clocks are finally starting to be phased out in favor of software and over-the-air time updates. So that's the story of quartz clocks in cars. Odds are if you own a vehicle after the late 1970s and it has an actual clock in it that's not on a screen, it's a quartz clock. So now you know. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I also did a similar video about speedometers in the 1970s and 1980s. Please go check out that video. It will be linked at the end of this one. And if you guys have any topics you want me to talk about that have to deal with 70s and 80s cars, little intricate pieces that you might not know too much about, please leave it in the comment section down below. I'll be sure to make more of these mini documentaries. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to rate the video, comment on the video, and subscribe if you really liked it. Take care, guys.